Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Earth and Life Science Subject. This is Sir Salazzo, your lecturer for today's session. Last week, we discussed the different types and classifications of rocks and minerals, and you've learned that they are formed from different places in a different condition. But the question is, what causes the rock cycle and the continuous alteration of the Earth? Actually, the dynamism of Earth is attributed to its never-ending geologic processes driven by internal or external forces. That's why for this week, we're going to discuss about endogenic and exogenic processes. From the prefixes alone, endo means inside, while exo means outside. Thus, we're going to talk about the different processes happening beneath and on the surface of the Earth. But before we're going to proceed to the lesson proper, I just want to leave a question that you're going to answer at the end of this session. The question goes this way. If geological processes seem to bring risk to human safety, where then is a safe place to live? Is there even any? Okay, let's discuss first what is all about endogenic processes. The endogenic processes on Earth take place within or in the interior part of the Earth. That's why in some references, they call endogenic processes as the processes within. Endogenic processes is associated with the energy originating in the interior of the solid Earth. This energy is what we call the thermal energy. The ground we live on is moving all the time and the forces within the Earth that cause the ground to move are called the endogenic forces. The geosphere of the Earth is subdivided into three main layers, the core, mantle, and the crust. The crust is divided into two types, the continental and the oceanic crust. The combination of these two is what we call the tectonic plates. Mantle, on the other hand, is divided as well into two layers, the upper and the lower mantle. The lithosphere of the Earth contains the crust and the upper mantle, while a stenosphere, also known as the plastic layer of the Earth, it is where the molten material is located. The lithosphere rides or rests on the asthenosphere, that's why the ground that we are living on keeps on moving. The inner and the outer core are both made of an iron and nickel alloy. The inner core is in solid state because it is experiencing a very high pressure from the three layers, from the outer core, mantel, and the crust. The pressure in the outer core is not high enough to make it solid, that's why it is in liquid state. So where does the Earth's internal heat come from? The driving force is the thermal energy of the mantle. Most of the thermal energy originates from the decay and disintegration of radioactive elements in Earth's core. When we say radioactive elements, we are pertaining to unstable elements. When a radioactive element has undergone decay, it will release an energy as a product of the reaction. The endogenic processes of Earth are responsible for earthquakes, development of continents, mountain buildings, volcanic activities, and other movements related to Earth's crust. Okay, here's some of the endogenic processes that played a role in the evolution of landforms on Earth. The first one is magmatism. Magma is the original material that make up igneous rocks. Magmatism happens when a magma is generated and develops into igneous or what we call the magmatic rocks. The process can take place either under the surface or on the surface of the earth. In short, magmatism is the formation of magma and the development of intrusive or extrusive igneous rocks. The process of magmatism starts from the formation of magma due to partial melting of rocks. Then the magma moved by the internal heat that reaches the mantle through convection flow. When magma reaches the lithosphere, it will now develop or solidify into intrusive igneous rocks due to the sudden decline of temperature. The movement of magma from its source is what we call volcanism or plutonism. 
Volcanism is a process by which usually happens after the magma is formed. Magma tries to escape from the source through openings such as volcanoes or existing cracks on the ground. So as the magma reaches the surface of the earth, it is now called lava. And when this lava solidifies, extrusive igneous rocks are formed. So this diagram shows the two endogenic processes that we discussed, the magmatism and the volcanism. The last type of endogenic processes is what we call metamorphism. Metamorphism is the process of changing the materials that make up a rock. Chemical components and geologic characteristics of rock change due to heat and pressure that are increasing or decreasing. You take note for this one. Rocks changing due to weathering and sedimentation are not considered to have undergone metamorphism because weathering and sedimentation are under exogenic processes. Heat, pressure, and stress are the main causes of metamorphism. Heat energy is important for many chemical processes because it initiates chemical reaction. Extreme heat affects the chemical composition of rocks. Pressure exerts two types of stresses on rocks. It's either normal or shear stress. The result of either stresses is to change the shape of the rock without breaking it. Using this diagram, we can conclude that endogenic and exogenic processes plays an important role in the metamorphosis of rocks. Because of endogenic processes, we have igneous and metamorphic rocks. On the other hand, the presence of sedimentary rocks is because of exogenic processes. Okay, so those are the different endogenic processes, the magmatism, volcanism or plutonism, and of course, the metamorphism. The geologic processes that occur on Earth cause stress on rocks. Geological stress is the force from pooling or pushing of plates that acts on the rocks, thereby creating different behavior or characteristics. These are the four different types of stress that influence rock behavior, the compressional, tensional, shearing, and confining stress. The first one is compressional stress. Rock push or squeeze against one another, the stress produced is directed toward the center. Hence, when these rocks meet, the orientation could be either horizontal or vertical. Horizontally, the crust may thicken or shorten. Vertically, the crust can thin out or break off. That's why compressional stress, usually what takes place in folding, which results in mountain building. So this diagram shows compressional stress. As you can see from the diagram, that the stress on both sides is directed toward the center. That's why they call it as compressional. So the product will be mountains or volcanoes. The next one is tensional stress. In tensional stress, rocks are pulled apart. Rocks may separate in opposite directions or move further away from one another. It is speculated that this type of stress is what separated all the continents in the world during the breaking of the supercontinent known as the Pangea. Okay, so this is the diagram that shows tensional stress. As you can see, the tension is at the center. That's why the rock was pulled apart. Next is the shearing stress. Some of the portions of a plate at the edges may break away in different directions, eventually making the plate smaller in size. This friction caused by this stress can cause earthquakes. Depending on the condition of the environment, shear stress usually happens at different rates at the boundaries of the plate. As you can see on the diagram, the movement of rocks is in opposite direction. That's why these rocks 
slip past to one another. So this diagram now shows shearing stress. So because of friction between the two rocks, it can cause earthquake. The last type of geological stress is what we call confining stress. In confining stress, the crust becomes compact, making it look smaller. This is different from shearing as none of the crust edges break away. This stress can cause sinkholes where the inside portion of the ground has already disintegrated without being apparent. However, if breaking away happens, it would come from the inside. This may retain the shape of the cross, but not its weight. In short, nothing may seem to have changed in the appearance of the cross because changes have occurred inside. That is what we call confining stress. So those are the four different types of geological stress, the compressional, tensional, shearing, and of course, the confining stress. We are done with endogenic processes, so let's proceed to exogenic processes. By the way, what is all about exogenic processes? The exogenic processes occur on or near the surface of the Earth. These processes are usually driven or influenced by gravity, water, wind, and organisms. This could be destructive occurrences that leave significant changes on the landscape and even in the ecosystem of an area. In extreme cases, exogenic processes can wipe out majority of the organisms inhabiting that area, especially the process of mass wasting and erosion. So the following are the different types of exogenic processes, the weathering, erosion, mass wasting, and sedimentation. The first one is weathering. When I say weathering, it is the disintegration of rocks, soil, and minerals together with other materials through contact with Earth's subsystems. This process happens even without movement or transportation. In short, weathering is the breaking down of soil, rocks, that happen in situ or on the spot. Actually, there are three types of weathering, the physical, biological, and chemical weathering. Physical weathering or mechanical weathering is the breakdown of rocks by mechanical forces concentrated along rock fractures. This can occur due to changes, whether sudden or not, in temperature, pressure, etc. For example, soil cracks because of extreme heat or drought, and in some cases, water, wind, and ice may abrade or scrape rocks or soil. These are examples of physical or mechanical weathering. On the left side, cracks on the soil are evident due to extreme heat and drought. And on the right side, the cracks in the rock was caused by frost wedging. When it precipitates, the cracks in the rock will fill with water. This water then freezes and as it does, it expands. The expansion applies pressure to the rock on either side and forces it apart. This cycle will continue until the rock eventually splits all the way down. The next one is biological weathering. Biological weathering is the weakening and subsequent disintegration of rock by plants, animals, and microbes. Living organisms contribute to the weathering process in many ways. For example, roots and lichens. On the left side, trees put down roots through joints or cracks in the rock in order to find moisture. As the tree grows, the roots gradually prise the rock apart. On the right side, even the tiniest bacteria Algae and lichens produce chemicals that help break down the rock on which they live so they can get the nutrients they need. And the last type of weathering is what we call the chemical weathering. Chemical weathering is the process by which rocks 
break down by chemical reactions. So new or secondary minerals develop and sometimes replace the original properties of the minerals in the original rock or soil. Actually, there are different types of chemical weathering. So those are oxidation, hydrolysis, and acid rain. The first one is oxidation. Oxidation is the reaction of a substance with oxygen. For example, when iron in the rocks reacts with oxygen in the air, it forms iron oxide, which weakens the rock and it turns it to a rusty appearance. Same true with metals. The other one is hydrolysis. It is the chemical breakdown of a substance when combined with water. So hydro refers to water and lysis means breakdown. In short, hydrolysis is the chemical breakdown of rocks by water to produce clay and soluble salts. For example, when water comes in contact with granite, the feldspar crystal inside the granite reacts chemically, forming clay minerals. The last one is the acid rain. Acid rain may cause metals or rocks to corrode or deteriorate and change their properties because of the reaction to acid by some of the minerals. When acidic rain water falls on limestone, a chemical reaction happens. New, soluble substances are formed in the reaction. So this dissolve in water and then washed away. So the minerals now will be absorbed by the aquatic plants or the aquatic organisms. So those are the different types of weathering, the physical or what we call the mechanical weathering, biological weathering, and of course, the chemical weathering. The next type of exogenic processes that we have is what we call erosion. The process of erosion moves rock debris or soil from one place to another. This process takes place when there is rainfall, surface runoff, flowing rivers, flooding, freezing, hurricanes, etc. This is an example of erosion. Because of the different agents of weathering, like water and wind, the bonds between rocks and soil disintegrates, causing it to collapse. These rocks now turn into fragments or sediments and soon be deposited in the seabed or riverbed. The other type of exogenic processes that we have is what we call mass wasting. Mass wasting is the movement of large masses of materials, rock debris, soil, and mud, down a slope or steep-sided hill or mountain due to pull of gravity. This process is very destructive in areas with increased water flow. This phenomenon may cause damage to a large-scale area just like what happened in Itogon Binget during the onslaught of Typhoon Pompon. And the last type of exogenic processes, we have sedimentation. Sedimentation is the accumulation of materials such as soil, rock fragments, and soil particles settling on the ground. This usually occurs in streams and sea erosions. Over time, the sediment load becomes thick and forms a new layer of ground. In some small inland waters, this sediment layer will eventually dry up the water and become part of the soil. In oceans, the sediment layer can form the ocean basin. Because geologic processes are constant, ocean basins change in size and depth. The change depends on the rate of erosion in their surrounding continental masses. So this is what it looks like in real life. First one is weathering. Rock broken down by exposure to rain, wind, and water, followed by erosion. So rock pieces fall down to the bottom of the cliff. And rock pieces now, or smaller pieces, are spread out across the area under the process of transportation or deposition. And eventually, 
these pieces of rocks or sediments get stuck together and becomes a rock under the process of lithification. So in short, the end product of exogenic processes are sedimentary rocks. That ends our discussion for today. And I hope that you learned a lot. And I know that you're still confused and you don't have any answers yet about my question a while ago. But try to visualize the drastic events happening in your environment right now and reflect on it. Maybe you will find your answer. By the way, before I end this session, I just want to share my quotation. Destruction is not a bad thing. Actually, it is a way to create something. Why do I say so? Try to think of it. The creation of paper was due to the destruction of many trees. The creation of the softest pillow in the world was due to the destruction of cotton plants. The food that you're ingesting right now was due to the destruction of multiple organisms. It's either plants or animals. That's why always remember that before you're going to create something, you have to destroy it first. But if you plan to create your future, it doesn't mean that you're going to destroy your present. Philosophically speaking, we are destroyed already, destroyed by everyday challenges. The destruction within us will serve as a way to create a better version of ourselves that will aid in the creation of our future. That's all for this session. Thank you for listening and have a good day ahead.